I came across an article this last week that I read. The first sentence of the article caught my attention. The greatest and most important adventure of our lives is discovering who we really are. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? You're probably thinking to yourself, how do I go on this adventure to discover who I really am? Well, don't worry. The article tells you exactly what to do. It gives a sevenfold answer. Number one, it says make sense of your past. Now, in times before, that meant that you would explore your past and try and come to some understanding. But now it means that you rewrite it to make it whatever you want it to be. Number two, differentiate. Differentiate yourself from the things that you don't like. The goal here is independence. Break free from societal norms and any family requirements that you don't like. Number three, determine what you want. You're going to get a kick out of this one. Determine what you want and then let that define who you are. So your most basic desire is who you really are. Recognize your personal power. Why? So you can strive for what satisfies you. You get kind of a theme going here, don't you? Someone said last night, as soon as I read that one, they said, this is completely backward. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Next one is um, wrecking, or silence the inner circle. That means dismiss any sense of right and wrong within and just do whatever feels right to you. The next one we might think is kind of good. Practice compassion and generosity. Sounds like we're heading in the right direction all of a sudden, doesn't it? Oh, don't worry, it's not. The reason you do this is because it's a very personal thing. It'll make you feel good about yourself. <laughs> know the value of friendship. Again, this sounds good until you read a little bit deeper. Remember, you were to differentiate yourself from your family in particular. Well, now you're called to create your own new family. And who's going to be part of your new family? Get ready for this one. People who believe in you. I would say God calls us to the exact opposite. <clears throat> Instead of finding ourselves, we're supposed to deny ourselves. Instead of discovering who we really are, we're supposed to know God and more profoundly to be known by God. And this journey that God calls us to is a journey that will last for all eternity. Have you ever thought about that? You'll never fully know God. You'll spend eternity getting to know Him and growing in Him. This will be the nature of our study day to follow the Messiah, which includes the greatest confession of all time. Namely, Jesus, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and a reminder of the high cost of true discipleship, which as we've been memorizing is to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow him. I'd like to read Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 18 to this morning. I'd ask you to stand with me. I'm going to read down through the verse that we're memorizing. When we get to 23, I'd ask you to say it with me together. This is Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 18. And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him and, asked, and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowds say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others say one of the old prophets has risen again. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised the third day. Then he said to them all, say it with me, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Scott Miller, would you please pray this morning as we look at God's word? Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. So this great confession is a result of a question that Jesus asked. And I would say this question is the most important question that must be answered. It's found at the end of verse 18. Jesus says, but who do the crowds say that I am? If we were to simply ask the question, we'd probably say, who is Jesus? And if you've been a Christian for some amount of time, you've probably heard that there are three ways that people propose you can answer this question. Jesus is either a liar or a lunatic or he is the Lord. He's a liar, that is to say, he knew what he was saying wasn't true. He's a lunatic, he didn't know what he was saying isn't true, or he's the Lord. What he said is the absolute truth. But in Jesus' day, the thought was that he was a return of a prophet. And this appears to be a very common thought in that day. It reached already to Herod the Tetrarch, as we looked at last week. And so they suggested in verse 19, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say that you are one of the old prophets risen again. And then he turned to the twelve and he asked them, who do you say that I am? Who do you think that I am? 
And you know the correct answer came from Simon Peter. Uh, there in verse 20 he says, you are the Christ of God. Now, there is a lot that can be said about this great confession. Uh, let me just say a couple of things this morning. Number one, it's important for us to note that this answer did not originate with Peter. Peter didn't come up with this on his own, nor did it come from any of the disciples. Now, you know this to be true because of what's recorded in Matthew. So go to Matthew chapter 16. Peter wasn't smart enough to figure this out. This came by direct revelation from God himself. Matthew chapter 16 declares this to us, a parallel passage that carries the, basically the same content. Look at what Jesus says there in verse 17. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So first and foremost, this did not come from man. It came from God. Next, I would say that this response is the essence of the full title of our Savior, namely the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I believe that if you look at it and study it, you'd come to the conclusion that it has all those components, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 16. Simon Peter answered and said, speaking to Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I would say that the Lord Jesus Christ, this confession is the most fundamental statement of the faith, the most fundamental creed, the most fundamental confession. He is the Lord God, He is Jesus a man, and He is Christ the Messiah or the Savior. I would also add one other thing that I didn't write down today in my notes. And that is, you cannot make this confession apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. You might be able to say the words, but for it to be a true confession arises from the work of the Holy Spirit. Paul writes about this to the believers at Corinth. He says that apart from the Spirit, you will say anathema Jesus. Let Jesus be damned is basically the thought. But only by the Spirit can you say Jesus is Lord. If I understand the context correct in that particular case, it would appear when your life is on the line and someone says either deny Jesus and live or profess Him and die, only by the Spirit will you continue to profess that He is Lord. Now I want to add to that my opinion that every article of faith, every statement that is true, every article or piece of doctrine can be connected to this title from the veracity of Scripture to the details even of end times. But let me say confidently with 100% assurance, every true believer, everyone who's born of God will make this confession from the heart. It will arise, even if it's just within your heart, this side of eternity. It is essential in salvation and I say that to distinguish it's not essential for salvation. This doesn't make you a Christian. This teaches us that God has changed your heart so that what utters or what comes forth is a true confession. Go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. I look forward to the day when I get to preach through Romans again. Especially Romans chapter 10 is a wonderful chapter. But let me just read a few verses there. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So two systems, either the system of faith which saves or the system of law which keeps you in your sins. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Well, let's go a little bit further. For the Scripture says, whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon Him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And again, we want to make sure we position ourselves appropriately. It's by grace and through faith. The utterance is one of faith that comes from God's grace. We would not make this profession, this true confession, apart from God's grace. Now that being said, we should also be mindful of the fact that every single individual at the end of history as we know it will utter those words. Ours is a true confession. Theirs will merely be a profession. Sadly, it will not save them in that day, yet it will be stated for God's glory. Again, we know this from Philippians. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. 
There will come a day every knee shall bow, <clears throat> every tongue shall confess. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 9. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now I want to stop for just a moment and make this personal. Have you confessed that Jesus is the Christ? Have you bowed the knee and surrendered your life? Have you asked God to forgive you? And have you placed your trust in Christ alone? Have you pronounced this great confession that Jesus, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God? I know many of you here I've heard a good number of your testimonies. But if there be someone here today who's not yet a believer, my hope and prayer is that today might be the day of salvation. That if you hear a still small voice, you will not harden your heart. You'll stop from seeking yourself and what pleases you and surrender to know Him for all eternity. If you've watched the news in the last couple of weeks, it's amazing how what seems to be the most important thing has suddenly shifted Suddenly, the most important thing right now is coronavirus, right? Of course, for some people, they think the most important thing is their retirement or the lack of funds right now with their 401k in the stock market. A couple of weeks ago, you thought it was the 2020 election was the most important thing, according to the news. You already know this is true. Those things are not the most important things. Nor, believe it or not, is your next meal or the hope of finding toilet paper in the weeks ahead nor your next breath. The most important thing is your eternal destination. And if as a Christian you understand that, then we need to also recognize we should live every moment of every hour of every day for His glory. Now what I find is interesting in this passage, this profound revelation, wouldn't you expect Jesus to say to the twelve, I just sent you out, you've come back, you've taken a rest, now get back out there and tell everybody what you now realize that I am the Messiah. But that's not what happens. There's instead a call to silence. Go back to our passage again in Luke chapter 9. The call to silence by Jesus in verse 21. He strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one. Again, I find this somewhat perplexing. To know this truth and be restricted from declaring it. It appears it's not yet time for Jesus to be revealed as the Messiah. This is a matter for God's perfect timing and it wasn't the time now. Let me also remind you the fact that we're not restricted. You and I are privileged to not only know this truth, but to declare this truth. And we should be a people out there telling others the good news that Jesus saves. Even in the midst when everyone's afraid, there is an answer, there's a solution for our greatest problem, which is sin. And He is the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is possible only because of the journey that He took. Look at verse 22. He declares to them what's going to happen, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day to suffer to be rejected to die and yet rise from the dead now we're going to look at all of these things in the future weeks in our studies but for those of you who like to know details this is the first time that jesus declared what was going to happen to him that he would suffer and die and he'll actually mention it again in luke chapter 9 before we're done and you also recall the disciples did not fully understand this you remember in matthew's gospel there was one who opposed him as soon as he said what was going to happen to him. Do you remember who that was? It was Peter. <clears throat> who was Peter? The guy who just made this great confession. And then he says to him, oh no, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. And then do you remember what Jesus did on that particular occasion? Peter rebuked Jesus and Jesus then turned around and rebuked what's interesting. It's interesting, isn't it? Rebuking Peter, but ultimately the evil one. And that's a reminder to us that anything short of this plan of God for salvation is a lie that comes from a pit that would suggest you can be saved by any other means. And the rebuke goes to the evil one. For the Messiah must suffer and die for you and I to pay for our sins. By the way, this is a reminder to me that to apprehend and understand truth is more than just a matter of revelation. It is a matter of illumination. You might know exactly the right things to say, but you might not understand them until the Spirit opens up your understanding to those truths. Not just for unbelievers, but for believers as well. And so I'm reminded again, it's good for us to be patient with people. 
What will we expect of unbelievers when we declare the truth about Jesus being the Messiah? The natural man does not discern the things of God. They're foolishness to him. So be patient and be in prayer. But even for fellow believers, be patient with them. God might not have yet opened up their eyes to certain truths. So be patient. Now with that being said, I want to continue on. I want us to look at the great cost, the high cost of discipleship in verses 23 and following. Now our memory verse is 23. I want to make some comments on that in a moment. But I really want to focus at first on 24, 25, and 26, the contrasting considerations in verses 23 and following. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man who gains the whole world as is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's at the end of his holy angels. Now when Jesus was talking about the great confession, he pushed out history as we know it to his resurrection. And I think that's significant, not to his death, but to his resurrection. But here in talking about the great cost of discipleship, he pushes out history that's not yet realized to his return, to the end of history as we know it. The major point of comparison is very clear. The stuff of this world versus what? That which is eternal. The thought is if you gain all that you can in this world and do not have Jesus, then you're ruined. It's more than just being poor, you're ruined. And for me, this thought that Jesus would say, if you're ashamed of me, when I return, I'll be ashamed of you. That's right on the same level of depart from me, I never knew you in my mind. What a fearful thing to think that he would be ashamed. We could ask the question, why? But you already know the answer. To love the world more than you love Christ means that you're part of an adulterous and sinful generation. Another parallel passage for our study today is Mark. So go with me to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. And just to set the context so you can see it's the same thoughts that are transpiring here in Mark 8. Look at verse 34. When he being Jesus called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. But now look at verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. A sinful and adulterous generation. Now if you're like me as you read this passage or hear this passage, maybe you're thinking about another passage in Scripture. It's a, my thought goes to James chapter 4. Go to James with me for just a moment. And keep in mind, who is James? He grew up in the household of Joseph and Mary, right? With Jesus. And by the way, there was a time when James, along with his siblings, hated Jesus. Before he saw the resurrected Jesus Christ, he wanted him dead. He wanted him to go to Jerusalem and suffer already prematurely. The reason I point that out is because I think James would say, what I'm writing about, I've been there. I've done that. I was part of this group that I'm pointing out right now. Look at what he says in James chapter 4. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasures that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures." adulterers and adulteresses do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with god there's no middle ground folks whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of god but praise be to god god is at work or do you not or do you think that the scripture says in vain the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously but he gives more grace therefore he says god resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. But if you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, if you deny yourself, if you take up your cross, and remember He said, how often? Daily. And follow Jesus, then you are rich. Let me make a few uh, applications at this particular point. And I want to combine the true confession with this great cost of discipleship. First one is this. 
Just having the right words is not enough. Don't you imagine through the years there's been a lot of people who said, Jesus, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, but it didn't spring from a heart that's been changed by the grace of God? Right words are not enough. There must be a true life of devotion. And by the way, this is not a call to your best life now. Do you get a sense here it's not about prosperity? You can have it all? If you're supposed to deny yourself, it seems like we're heading in the opposite direction. Daily dying to self. And I am mindful of the fact that oftentimes Jesus seems to say to those who want to follow him, you're not serious, go do something else. Because the cost is very high. It includes labor and pain. Sometimes it's physical pain. I'm mindful of the fact that some people would say, oh, listen, I'd rather suffer for Christ than in Christ. Could I do that instead? I don't think God differentiates if you're out there suffering for Christ or in Christ. I think he sees all pain as serving a purpose to teach us to be dependent upon Him. But it can also be the pain that's emotional and even spiritual. I think about Paul who said, what comes upon me daily is my concern for the fellow believers and a concern for them. And with that, there must be humility and submission for the glory of God and for the benefit of others. For those here who know the Lord, you know it's not so much about knowing you who you are but it's really about being who we're called to be. If you're stuck on yourself, you need to recognize that we are to become more and more Christ-like, denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following Him. How many of you have ever done like the Myers-Briggs personality profile thing? Anybody care to admit what they are? I think I am an INTJ. I don't even know what that means anymore, but I think that's what I am. So there you have it, right? And now we got this new thing out there called the Enneagram. Are you familiar with that? There's a hot mess right there. You get to be a five and a wing two. I don't know if those are chicken wings or what they are, but it, I will tell you it's amazing how many Christians get all involved in these things and somehow think now I've resolved all issues, now I know who I am. And I would say no, because our goal is to be conformed to the image of Christ. Regardless of what personalities we have, our goal is to become more and more Christ-like. It's not that we're evolving, it's that we're being conformed day by day. Then I think about those who are lost and trying to discover themselves. And I would say we should be saddened for them and also in prayer for them. In our recent seminar on the critical theory of everything, we talked about gender dysphoria. I can't imagine what it must feel like to be trapped in a physical body that you think does not accurately represent who you are, to be confused about your gender. But I would also say to us as believers, we better be careful how we navigate through with that. Because I think our first response might be, we just got to tell them the truth. In the beginning, God made the male and the female. He made them. This is the two genders. This is all there is. There's no sense of non-binary, a great fluidity of these things. We come off sounding almost arrogant. But we could also come off as those who laugh at people in their struggles. That doesn't serve a purpose. No benefit whatsoever. I would suggest sympathy because the truth of the matter is the father of the lies has greatly confused them and they are deceived. They're in darkness and it's the blind leading the blind. And as they struggle, I want to remind us once again, they are still people created in the image of God. We need to be kind to those people who are in bondage and pray for them that God would open up their eyes. Because the greatest need of all is not to discover yourself or figure out what gender you really are. The greatest need, like all of us, is the need of a Savior, the saving blood of Jesus Christ. I want to make a couple of closing comments from our passage today, so let's go back again to Luke chapter 9. I want to comment on the closing comment in this section, verse 27. Jesus says this in Luke 9, 27. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. It's really interesting to try and ponder, what was it they were going to see? When you think of the kingdom of God, it might have been the power of the kingdom of God. It might have been the judgment of the kingdom of God. It might have been the glory of the kingdom of God. Lots of different proposals on what Jesus meant. Some suggest that Jesus was saying, some of you are not going to die until you see the new heaven and the new earth, the culmination of history, thy kingdom come. Well, that would have meant that this would have been some non-literal interpretation. Others say the very next thing that happens is the transfiguration. And so the kingdom of God comes in glory and it's unveiled for just a brief moment. Others say, no, it's the power of God revealed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some say it's the beginning of the New Testament church proper, 
with the day of Pentecost. So others say, no, it's the judgment that came upon Jerusalem in A.D. 70. The power of God, the kingdom of God coming in judgment. Could be a combination. Could be the judgment of God upon Israel, the transfiguration of Jesus in small measure. Could even be dual fulfillment of prophecy. It might be that His glory was unveiled for just a brief moment, a greater glory coming when He returns in the parousia, perhaps His judgment upon Jerusalem pointing to the final judgment. Here's a thought for you. Don't worry about it. (laughs) It was for those individuals in that day, whatever was going to take place. So for us, it's fascinating, but don't get hung up on that particular detail. What I do think is significant, though, that I consider to be a precious gem in this passage, that at first I didn't catch until I continued to look over the passage, is what's stated in verse 18. Can I point your attention to what took place at the beginning of this passage? And it happened as he, Jesus, was what? Alone praying. It happened as Jesus was alone praying. Luke's the only gospel writer who reports that Jesus was alone praying before these things took place. This conversation about the great confession and the cost of discipleship. Jesus was alone praying. Now you could ponder if you're like me, what was he praying about? Could he have been praying for you and me? He did in John chapter 17. You ever think about how sweet that is? Jesus, while here on earth, prayed for you and I. For you and me. Excuse me. The other thought is, you remember there's going to come a time when he agonizes in prayer. He agonizes as it relates to this road ahead of him. But we don't know. Is it possible that Jesus just enjoyed spending time with his heavenly Father? Remember when the disciples came back from their hard work? He took them aside so that they might rest. And you remember during that time when they were resting, all those people showed up, 5,000 men plus women and children. It says Jesus took care of them himself during that time. He ministered to them till the feeding time at least. He healed them, cared for them. Is it possible that he needed to spend some time in rest with his heavenly Father? I'm not sure, but I can tell you this for certain. For you and I, prayer is essential. You and I, we've got to spend time in prayer. To be like Jesus, but also just to enjoy time with our Heavenly Father. To be ready for what lies ahead, the struggles and the trials, the pains that we'll experience, the burden of bearing that cross daily, denying ourselves and following Him. Right now, you and I live in the now time, the in-between time, between His first coming and His second coming. And life can be really, really hard. For those who want to pursue Jesus. But we have hope and we have confidence. I want to close out with the passage today in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. It is a passage of scripture that warms my heart, not just because of Paul's love for these believers at Thessalonica, but to be honest with you, because it reminds me of Community Bible Church, what's written here. When I get out and I spend time with other pastors, I find over and over again, that they're just burdened in their ministry because they feel like they're constantly having to fight with the people who attend their church. And I get a report of much greater things, of a church that loves the Lord, cares for her elders, and serves together. You know, one of the things that I noticed, it was amazing um, as it relates to the churches and their responses right now. I've been reading about, like, a lot of churches, how they're responding And one of the things that that was stated almost really early on in most of the emails that I read was make sure people know how to give online. And there's no question about it. Many churches right now with people attendance down, the offerings are going to go down and they won't ever return. And I thought, that's not Community Bible Church. We have a silly box in the back of the room. (laughs) And people are faithful to give on a regular basis in our church not because the Lord needs it, but because we rejoice in being able to give. And, and it makes, I just, I have to tell you, I feel like Paul about the church of Thessalonica when I think about our church. Listen to what he says in verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith, and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, 
that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Since it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God, on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. When He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You that You've granted to us in this body a heart for You. Lord, I I know that there is still much work that needs to be done for all of us to be conformed to your Son's image. I know that tomorrow we're going to have to take up the cross that you give us and follow you. And I know we're going to have to deny ourselves. And it's going to be hard, Lord. We're going to stumble at times. We're going to seek ourselves. We're going to be selfish at times. But I'm thankful, Lord, that you are constantly at work to transform us and conform us and to make us more and more like your Son. And I'm thankful that you've given us a hope anchored in the reality of who your Son is, for He is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're thankful that that's unshakable, unchangeable, that He does ever exist as our great High Priest interceding even right now on our behalf. So Lord, I pray that You would combine these thoughts in the way that we live. Not just the ability to utter the right words, but that we would live a life that includes even a great cost of being your children. May we indeed be those who deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow you. And we pray, Lord, that this would be done for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.